an engine designed to change everything. Nicknamed the Gasket Grenade, the 3.8-liter SX V6 was built to be the engine. Not a fluke, not a filler, it was carefully engineered to power the future, meant for everyone. And despite the chaos unfolding around the world, this engine still grabbed headlines and held the spotlight. But why? What made this engine so talked about and eventually so infamous? The world really was a different place when these beasts came along. By the end of the 1970s, the world was still recovering from the damaging oil crisis of both 1973 and 1979. The crisis had left a major mark on the average car owner. Most customers now wanted a car with excellent fuel efficiency, and they were serious about it. The V8 engines were falling off, as the monsters were simply becoming too much for some people. The pressure was insane, and the pressure was real. The rising fuel prices and stricter regulations played a significant role in creating this intense pressure. American manufacturers were supposed to downsize their vehicles. It was known. However, no one was willing to compromise on the power of these things. As the manufacturer worked on problems like fuel economy, they still could not stray too far from making machines that would produce a good amount of power. The brand was making a shift towards more front-wheel drive vehicles, and Ford was looking to make an engine that could bring the larger vehicles to have a fuel economy that was acceptable for the time. The engine was going to be something perfect and something that could be shared across cars of all types, whether they were trucks, front-wheel drives, or rear-wheel drives. To fill such big shoes, these beasts had to be very flexible. They needed to suit each and every type of car they were on. The competition was not messing around either, especially the one coming in from Japan. Japanese names like Toyota, Honda, and Nissan were making waves in the market. The gasket grenade was Ford's response. The brand simply could not afford to fall behind. The decision was made to base this new engine on the Windsor V8 design. This was done to keep development and production costs for the engines low, which was crucial for the brand. Till 1981, the engine was in development, and it finally hit the market in 1982 in a Ford Thunderbird. These engines had a long and influential run. Many changes were made to these monsters throughout the years. Cylinder heads were originally made from cast iron. However, this changed in the 1990s as the brand transitioned to aluminum heads for improved heat dissipation and weight savings. The block was crafted from gray cast iron, and the engine was precision machined for cylinder bores, crank journals, and deck height. A common mistake many people make when discussing this engine is confusing this beast with the British-built Ford Essex V6. These engines were actually built at the Ford Essex engine plant in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. A 90-degree configuration was used for these V6 monsters. This had been common in V8 engines, but it was pretty unusual for a V6 engine. The valve train on these engines was an OHV, an overhead valve pushrod with two valves over each cylinder. A wet sump oil system was used, and the camshaft gear drove the internal oil pump. The bore spacing was the same as the 302-351 Windsor V8, which was 4.38 inches. The fuel and ignition systems of these engines underwent numerous changes. Well, when the engines were first launched, these engines were using a two-barrel carburetor, or CFI, as the fuel system, and a distributor-based ignition system. Later in 1986, they shifted to a multi-point EFI fuel system and a TFI-4 ignition module. Then in 1992, they transitioned to a sequential multi-port EFI and DIS ignition system. The final form of this engine's fuel and ignition systems was introduced in 1999 featuring a revised sequential EFI and a coil-on plug ignition. The cooling system for these bad boys was seemingly decent. A water pump was used, which was belt-driven and mounted at the front. The thermostat was placed in the intake manifold housing, and the radiator was of a cross-flow type, initially made of aluminum, but later the brand began using plastic. No one can really deny that these beasts had an amazing start in the market. The engines produced approximately 210 to 230 pounds a foot of torque. 
At the time, this was more than enough to not only compete with Japanese brands, but also to establish a place for itself in the market. Customers really appreciated the power these things were providing, and many claimed the feel of these vehicles was very V8-like. The compact size of the engines, due to the OHV design, made these engines highly suitable for FWD cars. This allowed Ford to stay competitive with the Japanese sedans that were being introduced into the market. The gasket grenades were used to power many cars at Ford, and using the same engine for both RWD and FWD vehicles made these engines even more widely used. Ford was able to sell millions of these engines across North America due to this one smart move. And let's not forget that luck was on Ford's side. With the engine downsizing from V8s at its peak, introducing these engines into the market was perfect timing. Drivers were happy to shift to a vehicle that had better fuel economy, but was still going to provide them with the type of power that they were used to. Cars equipped with these beasts like the Mustang, Taurus, Mercury, Sable, Lincoln Continental, and even base trims of the Ford F-150 were making a significant impact on the market. But, as it is already known, this engine was known as the Gasket Grenade. These bad boys, which were once the pride of Ford, were unable to maintain the position they had acquired forever. So what made these powerhouses lose their touch? And what caused their downfall? The name Gasket Grenade obviously wasn't given to these juggernauts out of love. So, what really was the story behind that? Well, in the early 1990s, Ford made the switch to aluminum cylinder heads. They made this switch while the block they were using was crafted from cast iron. Both of these metals expanded at different rates, and this would cause major issues for the company. As both these parts expanded and contracted at different rates when exposed to heat, it would cause movement in the head gasket and even total head gasket failure. Another issue was the thin deck surface of the block. These were poorly machined and would easily warp under heat. Maybe to cut costs, but Ford was using cheap single-layer composite head gaskets. These head gaskets would degrade quickly due to thermal cycling. What made this even worse was the fact that these failures were happening quite early on. The repairs were not cheap either. Typically, they involved removing the entire top end of the engine. Many well-respected cars suffered severe damage to their reputations, and people began to lose faith in them. But being the gasket grenade was not the only downside of these beasts. There were many other things that were going wrong with these engines. The cooling system had its own issues. The cylinder heads were longer in these engines, and the cooling passage was poorly designed, leading to a serious problem of uneven heating and cooling. The cylinders on the extreme front or end would heat up significantly more than the other cylinders. And although the temperature gauge indicated normal, a localized overheating situation was developing. This uneven heat led to warped heads and accelerated gasket wear. The uncommon 90-degree configuration of the engine caused problems too. Earlier models did not have a balance shaft, and that made way for issues like a rough idle and engine vibrations. Ford did add a counter-rotating balance shaft in the mid-90s to manage this, but the reputation stayed. The leaks in this engine were another serious drawback, and this was primarily caused by the way the timing cover was positioned. The timing cover housed the water pump and sealed the front coolant passage as well. If the gasket were to fail, it would lead to internal coolant leaks into the oil and external leaks behind the pump. These problems were quite difficult to identify, and even after the issue was located, the repairs were insanely expensive due to the complex procedure. The reliability issues of these engines became a cautionary tale for the entire automobile industry. Companies across the sector viewed these failures of Ford as lessons and things they would never want to repeat. Inconsistent casting quality, the internal material mismatch, and poor gasket design were a few of the things that the engineers were way more careful of. The gasket grenade became material for the textbooks as well. Engineering problems and auto service courses taught their pupils about this glorious disaster of an engine, importance of coolant flow design, and the need for long-term durability validation were highlighted. 
The engine did leave a mark on the industry, but it left a much more prominent mark on Ford. Throughout the 80s and the 90s, Ford was doing massive numbers in the market, and the backbone of the brand for these two decades was the gasket grenade. Around 10 million units of these engines were sold during this time, and that is not a number you can joke around about. The positives of these engines can still be taken into account, but the damage the engine's gradual downfall had done to their reputation was severe. With new and improved technology emerging, in 2003, Ford finally decided to pull the plug on the 3.8-liter Essex V6. The gasket grenades went out of production for good, and more advanced engines replaced them. However, in the hearts of many enthusiasts, these engines live on to this day. For more stories like these, subscribe to our channel. Let us know your thoughts on 3.8-liter Essex V6 in the comments below. See you soon!